Hello, everybody, and welcome to General Wisdom, where we speak with WNL alumni about what they do, where they live, and how they wound up there. Today's guest is Sam Reed from the class of 2010. How are you doing, Sam? Hey, I'm good, Morgan. How are you doing? Excellent. Good. So, looks like you're in some place that is having a lot better weather than Lexington right now. What's your yeah, situation? Just, just your run-of-the-mill tropical paradise. I'm out in the, uh, Thailand right now. I'm at a uh, co-working space. You can probably see the big Buddha statue back there. Oh, nice. Yeah, uh, I'm on Koh Lanta, one of the many islands down in South Thailand near Krabi. Been out here for almost a month. Going to be here almost another month. Uh, with a little hop around to Singapore and Hong Kong. And my wife and I, who's also 2010, just been kind of going around Europe and Asia uh, the last six months after about a two-year trip to Hong Kong where we were living out there as well. So we're just kind of moving around place to place, working and seeing the sights. Very cool. That, that's a great way to do it after graduating. So I'm sure some people are kind of curious, what kind of professional situation do you find yourself in where you have the liberty to do all this travel? What, what, what's been your journey to this point since yeah. WNL? Well, it's been long and, and complicated. When I was just about to graduate, didn't even really know where I wanted to be, but my now wife got a job in D.C. And uh, actually, John White, the help desk, best boss I ever had, got me a job with uh, U.S. Army doing their equipping software, kind of top secret stuff, sounded real cool, thought, you know, hey, let's get a security clearance, go in the building with armed guards, you know, maybe there's something cool I'll learn, you know, are UFOs real? Who knows? And, uh... <laughs> And uh, it turned out to be a, like a lot more like office space than get smart. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, yeah. There's all tan cubicles and multiple bosses and that kind of stuff, and, and just hated it. You know, I, I just couldn't take it. So I started talking to a recruiter. And by the way, before I even got involved in this, I had no idea how awesome recruiters could be. If recruiters work for you. If you can get one on the hook who thinks they can place you, you know, it's, it's no skit off your back. They take their money from the person who employs you. And it's not uh, okay. supposed to come out of your salary, so you basically can get a real arm, you know, basically applying jobs for you, which is awesome. So I talked to a couple of those guys and got set up with this company called Link Senior out in D.C. in this co-working space. It's like one of the first co-working spaces. Now they're everywhere. But uh, at that time, like, it's just sort of, you know, I'd explain to everybody I knew, I'd explain to my parents, like, yeah, it's, a, it's an office where people just sort of sit around and work because they need physical address and a printer. <laughs> uh, they don't work together. You know, it's something you can do now that everybody just works on a, you know, on a laptop. But it wouldn't have made sense 20 years ago. Did that for a while, and, and sort of discovered throughout all that that you know, there's this kind of whole world out there, of jobs available, contract jobs, short-term things. You know, that that you can do if you if you get to know people and, and you have the, the guts to to try it. You know, if you know that the demands out there, at least in what I do, I. I guess I didn't even say, but you know, I, I'm a programmer. I was a computer science major, and, and there's a lot of opportunities there right now. Obviously, it's like everything's just blowing up. It has been blowing up for a while. But you know, if I'd never left that army job, I never would have had any idea that any of this stuff was even available. That you could that you could make it on your own. Like you know, you think that maybe you need five, ten years. You know, you become really entrenched, you get to know a lot of people, but it, it doesn't take that long. I mean. I went on my own the first time, I think like a year and a half after graduation. Had no job, just started contracting. It was surprisingly easy to do. But the, the number one thing that got me involved in it was uh, was working in a co-working space. It's just the best place for all that. You run into people just constantly, you know, and all they all they do is live in that world. They live in that world of jumping from place to place, contract to contract, doing what they want, taking two hour lunches, waking up at eleven. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> It's not a bad life at all. I mean, some of my favorite times ever was when I was working like three, four hours a day in D.C., you know, hanging out with the guys at the co-working space. I just loved it. Um, but eventually I got a really great contract, and the guys wanted me to move out to Hong Kong. So I, I went out there. I thought, you know, what the hell? Somebody's willing to pay for me to go out to Hong Kong? Why not go? Because uh, yeah. you know, if I don't do it now, I'm not going to do it, obviously. You know, once you... Once you have kids or something, this is not going to happen. Um, so we went out there and lived out there for about a year and a half. Uh, finished up that contract and came back. And we were in the states for all three months before we decided, you know, 
<laughs> let's go somewhere else. Uh, why not? And went off to Vienna, and the plan was to stay in Vienna for a while, but turns out visas in the EU are a little more restrictive than I remembered. <laughs> you can only stay so long, so I spent some time in Croatia, because they're not technically, they're in the EU, but they're not technically in the immigration zone, and I'm not in Thailand. Why not? You know, especially in Thailand, Thailand is a huge hotspot for this kind of stuff. You see a lot of people just sort of hanging out, working remotely, and whatever they do. There's a lot of programmers, obviously, but there's a lot of even lawyers, uh, accountants, a lot of people just going around who are working contract to contract, and they can do it because, you know, out here you can get a room for, I mean, a, a nice room is $30 a night. You know, if you're single and willing to put up with things that girls won't put up with, you can do it for like <laughs> Combine that with, you know, maybe $10 a day for food, for good food. You know, that's it. That's it. So, a lot, you know, a lot of guys are running contracts that are between, you know, $50 and $100 an hour. So, it's 20 bucks a day to live on. Wow. You know, yeah. Wow. Uh, not to mention, you know, it certainly beats winter in most places. In the US, so <laughs> yeah. You see a lot of people doing this out here. A lot, a lot, a lot of people. What, what is the nature of the current work that you're doing? So right before I left Hong Kong, the contract basically ended, but I was still there. In January of last year, I met up with a couple of guys at a conference who, for a long time, basically for a long time, I've been involved in Bitcoin, which we might have to explain. Yes. Yeah, actually, <laughs> since, since my time at WNL, which makes me some sort of a Bitcoin hipster, I guess, because I was, I was mining on my laptop back when you could actually make money doing that. And by money, I mean, like, dozens of cents. <laughs> uh, at the time, it felt silly. It felt silly enough that I didn't keep any of the coins that I that I produced, which probably would have been worth even today with the low change rate, probably would have been worth five, ten grand. So what can you do? As best as you can, and I know you you have probably gone through sure. many iterations of this over the years because it's such a big, new, game-changing, complicated in a lot of ways, but but beautifully simple in some other ways concept of. Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency in general, what, what is this <laughs> and why is it significant sure. and why should people, you know, pay, pay some attention to it? Sure, sure. Well, I'll try to give you the abridged version. It's always difficult to make this something that people will understand because as a coder, it's easy to kind of delve into the technical aspects, but to, to stay light on it, basically, it, it's, it's internet money. And uh, what, what's great about it is... You know, for a long time on the internet, sending money has always been a problem. You have to deal with PayPal, which has its own share of problems. You can do bank transfers, credit card payments, and there's a, there's a big delay and it's a big problem. And it's owned by somebody. And, you know, the greatest thing about the internet is that it's owned essentially by no one. I mean, it's sort of owned by the carriers, but in a way it's owned by no one and everybody is equal. And there's been a search for something like that for value for a long time. That's what makes Bitcoin so exciting. It's, it's the internet of value where everybody can get a piece and every piece is worth the same as any other piece and there's nothing in the middle and uh, that's sort of a hard concept for a lot of people to grasp is that there's not actually like Bitcoin the entity, there's not Bitcoin the business, there's just Bitcoin the thing. Um, the best analogy I can, I can give is uh, if you've ever downloaded torrents before and I know that you haven't, there is no central entity with BitTorrent. And actually, a lot of Bitcoin is based off of some of the concepts of Bitcoin. Having no central authority uh, means that there's no central authority to take down. And that has a really unique sort of power. Uh, you can't stop Bitcoin. I mean, look at how they've completely failed to stop it. And you can't stop Bitcoin for the same reasons. So when it comes to currency, currency is worth whatever people think it's worth. And you can use some sort of arbitrary physical thing like gold which has actual intrinsic value in terms of industry or in terms of, you know, jewelry, things like that, which are sort of more mental. Or you have, you know, fiat currency, that the paper that we all have in our wallets, which is actually worth basically nothing. But it's worth something because people think it's worth something. That, that's all it is. You know, it, it's a concept some people really have an issue with, actually. You'll, you'll hear libertarians talking about how, you know, the U.S. dollar used to be backed by silver or backed by gold. And that was that was a better time. And now it's backed by nothing, so it's worthless. But it's not worthless. It's, it, it has worth because people think it has worth. So just to get back to the basics of what Bitcoin is, what what's so interesting about it is that 
It's an internet currency that has a finite number of available units. 21 million is the most there will ever be. It's divisible up to 100 million parts. So technically, there's actually 100 million times 21 million possible units of value, but we still talk about it mostly in terms of whole coin, which is 100 million of these divisible units. Think of it like a dollar with 100 million cents. 100 million cents made a dollar. Right, right. Um, so there's 21 million of these things, and what's so unique about them is that they cannot be counterfeit. And that seems sort of like a crazy idea, because, you know, on your computer, right, you can copy and paste anything. So you might think, why can't I just copy and paste my wallet file and I'll have twice as many Bitcoin? But it doesn't work like that at all. It's, it's the key to a lock, and that lock is cryptographically secured. And just like if you have a locker with money in it, and you make a second key, you don't have twice as much money. What's right. in the locker is in the locker. And that seems crazy, but it's insured by really, really complex math that uh, I'm sure WNL's math majors would probably have a lot of fun looking at because it, it actually is really, really elegant, and it relies on it relies on some assumptions, of course, that certain things can't be broken, that, you know, for instance, that prime number factorization is really, really hard. But what's nice about it is that the, the assumptions it's based upon are very solid. And if they were to break, lots of other things would break. Really what Bitcoin is, is a, a large decentralized ledger book where everybody you know, writes in what they've done with their money. A and it's ensured that what you write cannot be false. And once it's written, it can't be unwritten, which is really important. But as it turns out, you can write other things than just, I sent money to you in that ledger book. And that becomes really interesting. Yeah. And, yeah. and in the future, you may be able to actually create uh, an entry that says, well, see this other ledger book. You know, see, see section two, paragraph A in this book, and there need, there's actually going to be guarantees that that book is legit, and that the reference is legit. And that's when things are going to get really interesting. And that, that would be side chains, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's a lot of guys spending a lot of money following up that idea. Uh, I met with uh, a guy from Citibank when I was in Ireland a couple of months ago. Uh, they have a division that's looking at this hard. And basically, every every big bank has like a venture capital division, you know, where they find they find interesting businesses in finance and they, they invest in them. They make a ton of money, and uh, they're doing a lot of work on Bitcoin because they see it, rightfully so, as the future of banking, because it is it is the future of banking. And, and whether or not Bitcoin, as it stands today, is the future of Bitcoin of uh, banking, is not really relevant. The cat is out of the bag. The ideas are out of the bag. The algorithm is out there for anybody to look at. The, the process is there for anybody to look at. And if this one fails, and it might fail, there's going to be a lot of chaos. It would be like the king dying. But a new leader will emerge. I guarantee it. A new leader will have to emerge. And the whole idea will keep on moving. And there's there's no way to stop it. it. It's completely unstoppable. And you know that's that's something we designed our, our business, uh, you know, with the assumption that that could happen. Every every exchange I think needs to run themselves that way. That that could happen. That Bitcoin could die, but another coin or whatever it may be called will rise in its place, and we'll need to support it. And aside from the people left holding the bag, you know, who lost, probably lost a lot of money, things will continue. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I met up with these guys for a long time. You know, like in a gold rush, I, you don't want to mine the gold; you want to sell the shovels. And that's exactly the idea that I had back in in November 2013. There was this big rush of alternative coins, and this idea kind of came to my head of, of of an exchange where you just trade between different types of online currency without involving yourself with banks at all. Because if you can cut the banks out, you cut most of the complexity out. You cut out. Uh, a lot of where U.S. law kind of gets involved with like AML and you know your customer KYC kind of stuff, and uh, you get rid of a lot of the fraud because all all this you know internet money is actually verifiable you know by design via math, and, and everything becomes way simple when you only deal with it. So this idea that I had was you know exchange where you just trade between all these. It's been done before, but it's been done badly. Started talking to these guys and said, no, 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 let's not do that. Let's do derivatives. Yes. <laughs> my non-finance background at the time, I'm like, derivatives, I'm, eh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, futures, options, exchange-traded funds, 
things like that. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see where this rabbit hole goes. And so when my contract ended, I started working on that full time. So I'm a co-founder on an exchange called uh, Bitmex, uh, B-I-T-M-E-X. And uh, we're, we're live now. We went live about three months ago. And I've been working on that pretty much full time since uh, April of last year. As it turns out, uh, derivatives are, are the next big wave in, in cryptocurrency trading. Just like just like any commodity in any place on earth, you know, and even talk about corn or wheat, you know, there comes a point where the market grows to the point where it needs more complex financial product. You need to be able to do more than just buy and sell. You need to be able to forward sell. You need to be able to buy and sell options, things like that. And that's the service that we provide uh, in a way that nobody else provides it. So it's it's kind of an institutional customer focused exchange, but we do have a lot of individuals on there. So anyway, it's an it's an internet business, obviously, working with working for internet money on the internet, and uh, we, you know, for that reason, you can work on it from anywhere. And so I was working on it on the streets of Hong Kong, going from coffee shop to coffee shop, and you know, once the sun went down from bar to bar, be that guy in the bar with his laptop. I was that guy. Uh, so that guy, and. Uh, <laughs> And kept doing that in Wisconsin when I came home, and, and then when we started going out here, all over Europe, and then all you know, all over Asia, still doing it. What types of things should a current student who wants to work in this space be doing right now to enter? There are a lot of, com of Bitcoin companies that are bootstrapping, much like we're bootstrapping. They might not have a lot of money, and and they would love to have the help of you know a student to do marketing to talk about, you know, various ideas to maybe work on code, if they can work on code, et cetera, et cetera. We actually saw a while ago a very successful uh, Reddit post, actually, on our Bitcoin where somebody was uh, talking about, you know, hey, I, I'm a student and I really want to work for a Bitcoin company. You know, does anybody need an intern? And he got, like, dozens, if not hundreds of responses, companies just wanting somebody. I mean, everybody wow. loves free work. <laughs> if you're willing to, if you're willing to offer it, you're going to find no shortage of takers for that, and it could be a good experience depending on the company. Uh, you kind of have your pick of the litter, I would, I would say, actually, if you're if you're offering something like that. So you could find something really interesting. Other than that, there are also open source projects that have big teams. Um, I'm on the Open Bazaar team. You know, the decentralized marketplace. They have a pretty large community. They have a large chat that's going all the time. There's a lot of really interesting, really knowledgeable people on there. They're actually working on a contract system similar to what we were talking about because they need that to run their, their buying and selling. That's a great project to get involved in. That's going to have a big impact and, and on and on. But number one thing you can do is just ask. You know, go on to one of the communities and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in learning a lot more and, and helping out. Does anybody need anybody? You have the freedom in this business to work on a startup and then use some of your leftover time to work on contracts to make a little bit of hourly money, you know, in case you want to, you know, keep yourself afloat or pay for your living expenses or something. It's pretty easy to do. Wow, yeah, sounds like you've got something figured out. Yeah, well, I mean, to be honest, it's something I sort of fell into um, and that I, I had no idea, when I, even when I left WNL, that the market was like this. Um, there's a huge, huge demand for programmers in general, the programmers with computer science degrees get a bonus, but you don't even need a computer science degree. For, for people who have sort of a more humanities concentration major, but, but are interested in entering STEM fields in some kind of way, you know, working for a startup, doing something like that, are, are there some sort of options for people who don't necessarily want to code, but want to be involved in some way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities still in, in design and marketing, you know, for these companies. You know, as they grow, especially marketing, they, they need a lot of marketing. They need people who have that eye, people who do, you know, good social media stuff, talk on forums, you know, get people excited, uh, that sort of stuff. But if you're willing to code, and, you know, I think a lot of people sort of just have this idea in their heads that it's really, really, really hard. And, you know... It's not. It's it's like anything else in that it has infinite depth. You know, like drawing a picture is easy, but you know, drawing you know a Van Gogh or a Klimt or something like that is, is practically impossible. Obviously, it has infinite depth, and there are people who always make you feel bad <laughs> by how good they are. But you know, Joe Schmo and his average business doesn't need Gustav Klimt 
paint him the picture. He just needs somebody who can draw a picture on the walls. He needs somebody to set up his WordPress blog or do a little search engine marketing or something like that. And there's a huge amount of demand just for that, just for huh. that kind of stuff. And if you can create those kind of face-to-face -face contacts, you know, this is like classic WL networking, right? Show up in an event, drink a couple of beers, don't get out of hand, and make some friends. Just <laughs> Half the WL education right, right there. You can go really far with that because if people trust you and if people know that you can get a job done, they're willing to pay. People will pay four or five times what they'd be willing to pay an outsourcer just to know that it's going to get done right. Because in technology, there's like there's basically no guarantees. I mean, getting the simplest things done is so frustrating for average business owners because you just have no idea if it's being done right, and 99% of the time it's not. If you can find, some, as a business owner, if you can find somebody that you trust, they're worth so, so, so much. So if you're a person who can offer that service, you, by extension, become worth a lot. When I was working, you know, co-working in D.C., uh, that's how I got every single one of my contracts. I've never once in my life advertised or posted a resume or anything. It's just, it just becomes, you know, you talk to people, people know people, everybody has a need. You know, I've never had to go outside that extended network, ever. Wow. Um, I, I guess the number one thing I can say about it is, is the market is nowhere near saturation. And even if you have no skills right now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't have good enough skills. And I, I'm, I'm not kidding, actually. I've seen people get jobs in 12 weeks going from zero, taking one of these courses and getting like a round 45, 50 grand equivalent job after 12 weeks of experience. I mean, that's insane. You can't wow. Take, you can't take, like, a 12-week law course and get a yeah, job. Yeah. You can't take a 12-week course in anything and get a job. But the market is so screwed up right now that you can take a 12-week programming class and get a job. In retrospect, what WNL experiences, academic or otherwise, helped prepare you for what you have faced after graduation? There are a couple of things I can really point to. One of my favorites is really... No work, work study, mostly under under John White, you know, help desk in the library, which was really great. Learned a lot from him, learned a lot from people out there, learned a lot about running something like that, which, you know, the help desk in itself is actually kind of like a little web company in a way, you know, if you talk, they have, they, have, they have a server in there, you know, and a couple of services they need to run and all that, and that's actually similar to what I do every day, you know. And the social life, of course, was, was huge, you know. The, the amount of socializing you do there, you know, is enough to turn any kind of, you know, awkward sort of introverted person into a huge extrovert. As as I was, I was pretty introverted, I think, when I when I started there, and uh, that makes a huge difference, you know, in, in the business world especially. I find generally that, like, when I go out to networking events, I mean, I never would have thought this would be the case, but I'm like the most talkative, extroverted person in most rooms, uh, <laughs> which which I never would have predicted would have been the case 10 years ago. I'm just like not that person. And, and I mean, that was a big part of that because, you know, it, it's, a, it's a meat grinder in a way. You know, you've got you to, gotta, you know, get in and stay in. And it takes a lot of effort, but it's a, it's a lot of fun and it teaches you a lot. Other than that, you know, the courses were great. I wish I could take them again. I've sort of been thinking about, you know, if I ever have some time over just hanging out in Lexington for a little while and retaking one of the 300-level classes or something. I feel like I'd appreciate it so much more now. Yeah. I mean, okay. I'd love to go back. The city's awesome, obviously. Yeah, what do you miss the most about the area? Oh, man, uh, the mountains. Uh, the fact that the weather is almost always great, aside from now. You know, you got to have a winter. <laughs> and one of my favorite classes ever was a geology class. I, took, and I know nothing about geology, and I care very little about geology. But I loved it, uh, you know, because it's like, it's like, it's got to be one of the best places in the States to take a geology course, is, is around Lexington. The place around there, the mountains, and what you can see, just incredible. You know, the hikes up to the House Mountain, and you know, all the things that we did, the lakes, and Devil's Marble Yard, you know. Oh, yeah. Even just cruising down the, the Mori and everything. I wish I still had that sick person, too. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun out there. You know, and just going back to that city sort of reminds me of all the fun that we, that we had out there. Just how it felt like a, felt like a home. Everybody was 
really friendly, especially especially the faculty and everybody. Yeah, you, you know, it's so, so small. I mean, I see the same people over and over, and I, I like that. You know, some people like big cities. But there's a million things going on. You know, I like knowing people around. Yeah, totally agree. Small town life has been awesome. It's always a fantastic place to come back to. I love how it changes, but doesn't change. Well, Sam, thank you so much for joining us on the program today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot, Morgan.